One of the most important things we do through the program is bring things forward, to look at the future through the lens of what has been or might have been. While Doug and his group previewed much of modern computing in their famous 1968 demo from Hypertext Links and the Mouse <laughs> to online collaboration, <laughs> for them, these were mere stepping stones to a much larger goal. Christina Engelbart, Doug's daughter and executive director of the Doug Engelbart Institute, will introduce us to that audacious goal, nothing less than to soup up our collective intelligence so that we might better solve the world's great problems. We're fortunate to have here tonight forecaster Paul Sappho, who will lead the discussion with our distinguished panel of experts on nuclear risks, climate and marine issues, and scaling change through organizations. They will explore how Engelbart's techniques for scaling innovation might apply to the complex issues that face us today. Next year will be a number of netiversaries, to coin an awful term, from <laughs> ARPANET at 50 to the web at 30. Engelbart's demo announced the key role of his network information center in the ARPANET and later the internet and pre previewed many features of later online worlds. So it was also the kickoff for our shared cyberspace. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Logitech Chairman Guerrino De Luca. As they say, a word from your sponsor, right? <laughs> We're actually extremely proud to, to be helping the organization of this event. Doug meant, meant and means so much for Logitech, for me personally, I'll tell you in a second. Uh, it's ironic that what he's most remembered for is the mouse. Even though the mouse was a tiny little component of an immensity that he showed when, when he showed the demo. I believe one of the reasons is the iconic nature of the little rodent, uh, the fact that we, we're going to sell our two billionth mouse in, in a few months, two billion, just scary. Uh, it's, but also it's because Doug was not a marketer. You know, he named everything else in a strange way, like NLS, the online system, NLS. Or even, you know, augmentation of collective IQ. It's very hard. It's not a slogan, right? But the mouse is very catchy. And be remembered for the mouse. Anyway, um, there will be a lot of things said about Doug, his, his impact in the industry, and most importantly, what it means for the future. I want to just mention my personal recollection of Doug. I had the fortune of, of uh, spending an hour, an hour and a half with him every month for 10 years when he uh, worked at Logitech. Um, as Mark mentioned, we, um, we were so grateful to him that we uh, gave him actually our, one of our co-founders, Pierluigi Zapakov, that may be here tonight, I don't know, um, did that and I think it was great. So I had the opportunity to meet him as he was working at the Bootstrap Institute inside the Logitech premises every month. And, and I was just worried about making mice and keyboards and webcams at the time and he talked about bootstrapping and, and collective IQ. And I was like, what is this? It took me a day or two after his meeting to absorb it. But every time, it was an inspiration. It was amazing. And every time I found something that he said that was relevant to me as the CEO of Logitech and to what we did. For example, the human centricity that Doug always had. Doug, Doug never thought that computers solved problems. He thought that teams, people, solve problems, and that's essential in his vision. And in a little way, we try to be faithful to that vision in the little things we do. So without further ado, thank you very much. Enjoy the event. And, uh, and between me and the next speaker, that you will see a, a brief video um, celebrating the life and mission of Doug, as well as footage from the original demo. Thank you very much.
Douglas Carl Engelbart is a key pioneer of the kind of computing we do today. Interactive, connected, graphical, and personal. As a Navy radar operator in the Pacific, he had read Vannevar Bush's famous article, As We May Think. Its ideas would help flesh out the vision that became his life's work. To augment human intellect with techniques for collectively organizing and refining knowledge. I suddenly wondered, hey, what kind of goals should I have for career? And then for some reason, within five minutes, what popped in my head was, what if I try to maximize the value my career has to mankind? Oh, that sounds good. I have no idea where it came from. Mankind isn't getting all that much more effective at collectively dealing with complex problems. Maybe that's what I could concentrate on. So that's what I committed to. I first uh, learned of Doug Engelbart in 1961 when I was a program manager at, at NASA headquarters in their Office of Advanced Research. And a proposal from Doug came across my desk uh, proposing to work with computers in the, de in the development of information, not numbers, not arithmetic, but information. Engelbart's uh, proposal was the first concrete manifestation of this idea that I had seen, so I funded it uh, right away. In 1968, Doug's team at SRI showed off many core features of modern computing for the first time in the so-called mother of all demos. There was a new kind of pointing device. I don't know why we call it a mouse. Sometimes I apologize. It started that way and we never did change it. There were windows, hypertext links, collapsible views, and other features for navigating information. If I want to, I can say, the library, what am I supposed to pick up there? I can just point to that and, oh, I see, overdue books and all. Well, there was a statement there with that name on it. Go back. He showed online collaboration, including document sharing, messaging, and video conferencing. I say, now computer, do the automatic switching that'll bring in a camera picture from the camera mounted on his console, such as the camera mounted on mine is. Hi, Bill. You can see my work, you can point at it, and I can see your face and we can talk. So let's do some collaborating. Engelbart's lab hosted the Central Network Information Center for the ARPANET and later the internet. The forthcoming involvement is this ARPA computer network, the experimental network that's going to come into being in its first form in about a year. Engelbart's team practiced a process he called bootstrapping. And this item down here is the term bootstrapping applied in a slightly new sense. We're applying that to our approach where we're saying we need a, a research subject group to give them these tools, put them to work with them, study them and improve them. Aha, uh -huh. we'll do that by making ourselves be the subject group and studying ourselves. A number of NLS's technical ideas eventually got picked up by mainstream computing. The mouse, word processing, windows, and simple hypertext links. But the more sophisticated ways of navigating knowledge in NLS were forgotten, from collapsible views to integrated browsing and editing. Most of Engelbart's ideas for improving how organizations function and thus raising their collective IQ also got left behind. One of the big things we talk about about the potential is the kind of a collective intelligence. So if you look at something that you could call a social organism, an organization, and realize that if you drew an envelope around it and watched how it interacts with the outside world, you'd pretty soon be able to get some sense about what kind of IQ it has in it. Like how well does it understand what's going on? How quickly and subtly does it make a decision? How well does it marshal resources and how smart a plan does it make? Da, 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 da. And so how well does it learn what's going on? And how well does it generate new knowledge and creative IQ? A key concept was how computer tools and human organizations could co-evolve. He spent the rest of his career trying to promote his larger vision. With his daughter, he co-founded the Bootstrap Institute and mouse maker Logitech donated facilities. He hoped to start a snowball effect of innovation, improved techniques enabling further improvements, and so on. I began to think about 
the improvement process, etc. And then I realized, oh, um, probably every organization that's going to change has an explicit category of activities. That one of them is doing your everyday work, and the other one is improving your capability to do that work. And that everybody's sort of sitting at a certain capability level, and there's a capability frontier out there because the technology is booming ahead and all kinds of options for how you change your learning in your human system. So, hey, it's a whole unexplored frontier. What can we learn from Engelbart's unfinished revolution today? Greetings, I'm Christina Engelbart, and I'd like to welcome all of you here. It's really wonderful to have you uh, help us celebrate this very special anniversary date. Um, before we launch into the future, um, let's, uh, let's key in on this guy and see what he ha would have to say. And what I believe that would be, would be great effort, guys, noble effort, but there's one small problem. So. This man was not a pessimist, um, quite to the contrary, but he was a realist, and, um, and this is what kept him up at night. What does that look like? So basically he thought it's a race. The digital technology revolution is just soaring, the exploding rate and scale of change. On the other hand, um, we have organizations trying to uh, systematically um, improve for the future and become more highly evolved. But the explosion of digital technology is really at putting a tremendous pressure on the organization's ability to do that. Uh, because it's taken a life of its own, it's on a different trajectory. And so there's so many technologies these days that have not evolved in symbiotic relationship with the organizations. There's wonderful emerging technology coming out, on the other hand, who's Who's pioneering those really important capabilities that Doug Engelbart started years ago? So um, to understand this gap is a widening gap, and the um, formation of uh, digital technology is increasing the speed of everything. So it's increasing the speed of all the um, other global issues, including climate change and all of that. And climate change itself is a, is a threat multiplier. It, it, it exacerbates other threats on the planet. The explosion of digital technology unchecked is itself also a threat multiplier. And that gap is a cause for concern. In fact, my father believed that it was extremely serious. And that's why he dedicated his entire career to that. The gap itself um, is a, um, is a, it represents a risk um, of untold caliber and uh, including the potential for, um, for uh, let's see, for uh, collapse, for extinction. On the other hand, it represents an opportunity, a golden opportunity for really rising to the occasion and getting that capability in our organizations to jump the curve and get ahead of it. So what he saw was the single greatest um, existential challenge of our time, not climate change, not cyber war, not population explosion. The single greatest challenge and opportunity is our ability to raise the curve on our collective ability to collectively solve important problems. So that being the single greatest existential challenge of our time. And that's why he dedicated his life to solving that problem, starting from the beginning and all the technology he prototyped. It was all in the service of pro prototyping the organization of the future that would be flat, fast, and flexible, and highly evolved so that it could tackle important problems. And I think they did a pretty good job. Um, but a lot remains to be done. And so this takes us back to the slide that you saw earlier in, the, in that wonderful video. Um, this is the cornerstone of a larger um, strategy that he came up with from the very beginning and refined all throughout his uh, career. So uh, he put it in terms of a bootstrap paradigm map because the idea is that we need to be bootstrapping our capabilities. We need to be bootstrapping our organizations. We need to be bootstrapping our collective IQ. 
So what are the limiting factors? And what he came up with was the single greatest limiting factor is the paradigms that people bring to looking at the world, how they fit in the world, and where our world needs to go. What are the opportunities for change? So he created a paradigm map. And so all of these tiles on there are what he thought where we needed to shift our paradigms in order to prepare for the future, jump the tracks, and get on the right trajectory. Um, so it goes around there and all that. So now I, um, one of my jobs has been to try to distill all of that into an actionable strategy that organizations can apply within their own teams and initiatives and um, companies and institutions. Um, five accelerators. So I'm not going to go into them in detail tonight. Um, that would be for another time. But it covers all the, um, the key things that he introduced in that video, which are essential to, um, to, to galvanizing that capability and getting them into the hands of the groups and organizations, the networked initiatives that are trying to tackle the, um, the toughest challenges. Um, so this brings us to what he thought would, was the greatest opportunity for our time, the greatest opportunity to leverage our collective smarts, to launch a serious effort improving collective IQ. He started that um, in the 1960s, but it kind of trailed off And what happened. So we need, this is really a serious problem, and we need a serious effort to do that. Um, focusing also um, how the collective IQ can be leveraged to improve how we improve. That ABC and the way the organ, we have to accelerate how we improve, not just improve the capability. So who's the customer for this? Who's the, who's the end customer? So think of it as the networked improvement initiatives. These are the initiatives like the ones that you're going to hear tonight. It's all the initiatives and organizations that are trying to tackle those toughest problems. And one of the one of probably the greatest um, opportunity for single point of leverage in all of this is to start networking the people, the organizations, the initiatives that are working on the toughest problems and bring them together to help collectively guide us into this. Um, so, we haven't scratched the surface, and my dad would be the first one to tell you, noble effort. But um, here's another really important point where he was talking about the importance of the co-evolution to a reminder that technology should not aim to replace humans, rather amplify human capabilities. Whether it's the individual, whether it's the team, the initiative, the organization, the institution, or society at large. When you think of Doug Engelbart, please, the least important question you can ask about Engelbart is what did he build? The most important question being what world was he trying to create? So uh, without further ado, um, let's go ahead and welcome Paul Sappho to the stage. He's our moderator for the panel, and he'll be introducing the panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, let's go ahead and get our panelists seated. Just a quick show of hands. Who was here on Sunday? Good. I saw, I saw some familiar faces. Uh, so here's what we're going to accomplish this evening. Sunday was a day focused on the 1968 demo, Doug's work that led up to that demo, and the consequences and the impact on the world that the demo had. So you can think about Sunday was 1968 up to the present with a hint of what lies ahead and saying all the important tasks we need to do. Tonight, we're going to pick up the conversation in the present and go out another 50 years. And so if Sunday was focused, uh, in, at least in part, upon the enormous technical challenges that had to be met to make that demo happen and then the attempts to diffuse it further out, Tonight is going to be focused more tightly on basically the way I think it is we're tapping into the motivations 
that Doug had that led to the 1968 demo, because we all know that at the end of the day, Doug was about people and organizations. Computers just happened to have been the tool that he had at hand. If Doug had been working in 1452, he would have been working with movable type, because that was the available technology at the time. So that's the agenda for this evening. And to put a very sharp point out, we need more Engelbarts. We, in the sense that we need more people who are long distance thinkers and long distance doers tackling the greatest challenges facing us ahead because quite frankly, the challenges have continued to grow faster than we've grown before. So now let me sit down, I'll introduce our panelists and I have to look at my notes for this because I have the opposite situation to most panels where you don't know the panelists. When I was thinking about this, I thought, I gotta make this introduction short and efficient. So I limited myself to one page for all three of you. We'll see how well I do here. All the way over on my left, your right, Erica Wolseley is the founder and CEO of Hydrus. And she's a marine biologist, uh, Dr. Erica Wolsey, forgive me, marine, it, it's, uh, and, uh, and, and she is an ocean design fellow at Stanford, associated with the Hopkins Research Lab. Uh, and in addition, uh, since my bias, she's teaching at the D School, uh, and, uh, and I teach at the D School as well, so it's wonderful to uh, have her at Stanford. Uh, she leads expeditions, she's a kayaker, uh, she's also a, uh, a, 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 what's, what's your highest, you're a master diver? I'm a dive master. Dive master, yes. And she also, this is my favorite, she works as a volunteer at the Cal, a volunteer diver at the California Academy of Sciences, which means she does windows. <laughs> so next time you're in the Cal Academy and there's a diver going past, wiping the windows, Take a look if you see the, 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 the blonde uh, locks coming out from under the wetsuit. It just could be Eric. We have to wear hoods. Yeah. Yeah. So it's hard to tell. I thought, so, well, then wave at her. If she waves back, you'll know it was Erica. <laughs> next, uh, next Erica is, is Ben Rattray. 2007, Ben started Change.org. How many people here are Change.org members? Show of hands. There, it's up to 250 million now, isn't it? Uh, and it is the largest platform for uh, social change on the planet and a marvelous example of exactly the sort of thing Doug would have absolutely loved, is how do you scale things up? Uh, he was named by Time Magazine of, as one of the 100 most influential individuals on the planet. More importantly, he's a Stanford grad. <laughs> He also went uh, someplace in London, the London School of Economics or something or another, um, and, and he's a Californian as well from Santa Barbara. Last but not least is Erica Gregory. Erica is the uh, managing director at N Square, which is a cross-disciplinary uh, effort to work on reducing the nuclear threat She's also a serial entrepreneur. She started the Idea Factory and Collective Invention before uh, N Square, and she is a forecaster by profession. She was involved with Global Business Network, which in its day was uh, a real pioneer in scenario planning and the like. So here's how we're gonna do it. I've asked each one of our panels to, to give us an appetizer, just a couple of minutes about their work and where they see it touches on Doug's vision. And then we're gonna throw this open into a conversation. And um, I'm still not sure how I'm gonna get the two Erica things. We'll just both look at you every time you say Okay, it. or we yes. could change your name for the, no, I won't. That would be fine with me, okay. actually. Let's start with Erica Wolseley. All right, so as Paul explained, I'm a marine biologist, and I was so compelled by coral reefs. So my specialty is coral reef ecology. I did a lot of my research in Australia on the Great Barrier Reef. So I've been extremely lucky to explore these really beautiful and vitally important ocean ecosystems. And I had a um, front row seat to the mass destruction of coral reefs over the period from 2015 to 2017, which 
because of higher than normal ocean temperatures, coral reefs started to bleach or turn white and die. And over just a couple of years, about half of the Great Barrier Reef bleached. And so it was around that time I started really thinking about how maybe knowledge isn't our limiting factor in solving these problems. Um, maybe it's all about the translation of scientific discovery into public understanding and behavior change and political action. And so I moved back to the Bay Area where I grew up and I became a co-founder of a nonprofit called The Hydras. And our tagline is open access oceans. So we wanted to make science accessible and beautiful and visual. And we play around with uh, different types of technologies. Um, we started out doing 3D models of coral reefs through underwater photogrammetry and have made these data rich and beautiful digital files um, open access online. And they've been used by educators and scientists and artists to share coral reefs. And we also are working with virtual reality. And what I've been trying to do a lot of my life is bring everybody to the ocean, because I really believe that you can't really care about and work to protect something you never see or experience. And um, the advancements in immersive reality and virtual reality are pretty astonishing. And so at the Hydras, we've been making virtual reality experiences to try to replicate what it's like to go diving. Um, and there's some really interesting research I know coming out of Stanford as well on how that kind of technology can improve empathy uh, towards environmental issues. So I'm really interested in learning more about um, what this can do for the oceans. And something that really resonates with me um, regarding Doug Engelbart's work is just the, the notion of networks of networks and scaling. Because the ocean is so huge that every problem in the ocean is a huge problem. And we have uh, warming ocean temperatures, ocean acidification, all of the heat that's in our atmosphere, about 93% of it goes into the ocean and ocean acidification. And so the IPCC report that was released recently, um, the latest one, says that we basically have 12 years, so until 2030, to reduce our carbon emissions by about 45% in order to hit the target of, of warming above pre-industrial levels by only 1.5, so keeping it to 1.5 instead of 2. And the, that difference, even though it's just half a degree average globally, it is the difference of having coral reefs completely gone everywhere on Earth versus still having coral reef ecosystems that can um, support tremendous biodiversity and support human communities. And in order to reach this goal set by the IPCC report, we really need rapid and unprecedented change across all of society globally. And so I'm very interested in the idea of raising the global IQ and creating these systems and using technology as a tool. <laughs> as we were organizing this panel, I was imagining what if Doug were here and what would he take from this? And, he would instantly resonate with your emphasis on, on systems as a thinking like a systems builder and technology as a tool. Ben. Yeah, when I reflect on this, you know, what is most striking to me is the stark disconnect between the extent to which we've had technology-driven leveraging of collective intelligence for many industries around transportation, communication, logistics, pricing, ad targeting um, and the whatnot, and uh, how little that has been the case in the realm of politics and democracy and policy, uh, despite the immense consequences, I think largely negative, of the way in which we proceed in that domain currently. Uh, and if you look at, I think it's worth breaking down how broken it actually is and how unintelligent it actually is. I mean, first of all, is three, I think, fundamental problems. The first is the extent to which um, 
people's limited information actually makes it the case that uh, their actual preferences are not adequately represented oftentimes by their votes or their polling for different issues. You see this a lot with deliberative polling. James Fishkin at Stanford has demonstrated this pretty consistently where the more information you give people in controlled environments, actually you recognize that their express policy preferences aren't really what they should be. The second is, uh, even insofar as we had an accurate mapping of individual pr people's preferences, uh, there's been a lot of research around how there's effectively very little to no correlation between the preferences of the mass public and ultimate policy outcomes in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. It's literally almost entirely directly causal related to sort of special interests and elite interests. Uh, and the third is, even if we had an accurate understanding of people's preferences and efficient mapping onto that for legislative purposes, and there's a lot of things you might say about how to craft legislation. One of the words you would not use in characterizing it is intelligent. Um, I mean, it is a remarkably painful, I don't know, I worked in DC for a while after Stanford and it was a painful process. And so what is tragic, I think, to me in looking at this is looking again at another divide, which is the disconnect between how bad it really is and how much we accept it seemingly with little protest. The systemic focus that we have on so many other issues except the most fundamental way in which we have representative democracy. Like we literally, we celebrate how old our system is. In every other domain, we celebrate innovation, improvements, augmentation, and we have this like reflexive, sort of reflexive deference to age in this case. And, and literally, if you had a new opportunity to craft a new society and leveraging all the information that we have today and technology, there's just no way you'd create a representative democracy with the type of systems we have today. And so what I think is worth contemplating is well, what would that look like? And, and what is surprising to me is, I think there's a, a one at least pretty sort of robust, fecund path that few people have really pursued, and I'll just outline it briefly, um, because I think there is an opportunity to use collective intelligence in highly leveraged ways in the service of humankind in the long term uh, in the democratic space. And it really is, you know, it's liquid democracy, deliberative democracy, and um, what effectively is, is a space between representative democracy and direct democracy. And I mention it because we will, uh, as I think hopefully many organizations, try to enact a system like this. I think it has to happen outside the government, but I'll just walk through briefly, basically. Uh, I think there's three parts. So right now we're trying to aggregate the largest audience possible to represent at least 50% of voters in the world's democracies. We are about 20% for the world's biggest democracies right now. Um, as we get that audience, what we want to be able to do is to, one, so deliver to every, let's say, American, half of American voters, a personalized ballot directly over a mobile phone the day before the primary and the general. The second thing is, on that ballot, we think that what needs to happen is we call a trust graph. So people will identify the people and organizations they trust the most, um, whose opinions they respect on policy or on individual selection of candidates or ballot initiatives. By following those people, they then can look at your phone in real time, at any time right before you vote, and when you look at the 40 different offices with such little information and all the ballot initiatives, you can look at 30 seconds at a personalized ballot and use those as proxies for informing your vote. And insofar as we're able to do this with any degree of leverage, 10, 20% of the public, which I think is possible, um, then the people who are the most trusted, you've built this trust graph of people who have basically been proxied, have been delegated power in a way, will be the most influential people, I think, in America. Um, and we'll then map that onto an opportunity for anyone to propose legislation in the country. Anybody can crowdsource it, suggest it, and there is then a map of the most trusted people who will endorse or oppose legislation. And because of the influence this trust graph will have on the ultimate elections and the next elections, elected officials will be highly incentivized to pay attention. Um, it's not to say that that specific system in particular will work, uh, will be able to execute, um, or it will be the ultimate solution. I think we will have a really good chance of this. It's merely to highlight like, that kind of thinking. Like, it's striking to me the dearth of investments in that kind of what seems to be radical, but I see quite pragmatic and necessary applications of technology and collective intelligence in service of addressing the biggest problems of our time, which whether we like it or not, our government is doing every day. <laughs> and I think of the work that you do at change.org and, and you know, you're going right to the heart of the notion of collective intelligence and talking to folks who were around at the start of the World Wide Web and who helped design it, you know, 
you have the feeling that it's a little bit, they were surprised. They thought the system would naturally amplify intelligence, and it seems to have done the opposite. Um, and you know, reminds me of the famous comment uh, about by Einstein that the difference between intelligence and stupidity is that intelligence has its limits. And, <laughs> And social media has no limits. And social media has no, no limits. But I still like cat videos. And, and one comment on, you know, <laughs> this idea of leveraging trust, it's not new, right? I mean, the, the web is based upon the most effective platforms on the internet are using technology, many of them, are leveraging trust networks. I mean, Google PageRank is basically a trust network of people that are proxying relevance based upon hyperlinks that are registered as votes for the most relevant site. Um, you know, you have things like eBay would never have worked but for a trust network of random buyers and random sellers that no one knew otherwise. I mean, imagine Uber or Lyft with, or Airbnb with no trust graph. Wikipedia, I mean, this happens all, so we don't have this for political information or for voting, but we have this for commerce and basic transactions. And I think there's a real missing piece there and I think there's a real opportunity. Good. Erica. Yes. Gregory. Yes. Well, I um, did not know Doug Engelbart, um, but a lot of uh, uh, his thinking has really influenced my career in uh, ways big and small. And one thing I was thinking about um, earlier when we were watching the video and listening to Christina is the degree to which it must have been frustrating to Doug to be able to uh, make real progress on some of the technical solutions that he cared so much about, but not really be able to accelerate human evolution <laughs> um, in quite the same way. And I'm really struck by the fact that, um, uh, in looking at the graph that Christina showed, we do have this tremendous advancement technologically, and we have tools now that should make us better at cooperative work and at collective action, and again, should be improving our collective IQ. And yet, uh, we don't really, by and large, have the same facility with the kinds of softer skills or the human systems that would uh, allow us to make good on the promise that he was really um, trying to realize. Um, and so I'm here not because I'm a, uh, an expert about nuclear weapons, which I'm sure will become obvious as I talk, uh, but I am uh, somebody who knows a lot about creating teams who are quite good at uh, doing cooperative work across boundaries, across sectors, and so forth. And uh, I was asked five years ago to work on nuclear weapons. Uh, and really, the remit was to accelerate our global nuclear arms control agreements, uh, the achievement of those goals. Um, you know, one short way to say that is that we would like to think that nuclear weapons will never be used again, either by accident or by design. Um, and, but I reflect on, uh, as I think about that task, I think about the fact that uh, 70 years ago, we saw a cooperation in the scientific community that was probably unprecedented in human history, uh, and that was uh, during the Manhattan Project. Uh, for better or worse, there was tremendous uh, cooperation and there was tremendous innovation happening, um, and there was a group of people who were uh, working on not just the margins, but at the very heart of a wicked problem, which both of you have talked about, wicked problems. We know something about wicked problems now. We know uh, that they're really a complex of many different types of problems, dilemmas, puzzles, and so forth. And we know about wicked problems that by just by the nature of working on them, you change them, not always for the better. Um, and part of the notion of working on wicked problems is you have a responsibility then for the outcomes of everything that you do, uh, for the unintended consequences of what you do. And when you think about nuclear weapons, what happened is that 75 years ago, we locked in to some of the solutions that came out of the Manhattan Project, uh, and there have been tremendous downstream consequences. Uh, we locked in politically, culturally, uh, technologically on some of those solutions, uh, and they have shaped everything for the last 70 years. Uh, they've shaped politics, they've shaped culture, they've shaped uh, the way we work with each other globally. Uh, but a lot of people have been hurt by that early lock-in. Uh, certainly anybody who lives downwind of any nuclear test sites uh, have been hurt, and a lot of those are native peoples around the world. 
Uh, and I would say in, uh, it's probably not a stretch to say that our democracy has actually been hurt in the sense that there's really not a less democratic process than making decisions about nuclear weapons globally. Um, some of you may have heard of this expression, the nuclear priesthood. Uh, but what happened when we locked in around nuclear weapons is that we created a very insular uh, group of people uh, and we ceded responsibility for their decisions to them, thinking that it was too complex, uh, that we didn't have a way to engage with the issues. 1980, a lot of people did go to Central Park, and I'm not belittling that. We certainly had a very active anti-nuclear movement at one time. But in the last 30 years or so, that has not been the case. Uh, people don't feel that they have a way to engage, and so we've really sort of walked away from this issue. So what we're trying to work on now is, and I'm struck actually by some of the things that Ben was just talking about in terms of liquid democracy, I'm struck by uh, the opportunity that we have now to bring back some of that collaborative spirit uh, that the Manhattan Project originally represented and uh, to move at a time where deterrence theory begins to break down in the 21st century when we have non-state actors who are trying to get their hands on bomb-making materials, nuclear bomb-making materials. Uh, deterrence theory breaks down when you have a guy drop a socket in Damascus, Arkansas and at a Titan II missile silo and nearly destroyed uh, <laughs> that entire part of the, the nation. It was really only by accident that that didn't happen. Well, it was uh, a red state. It was a, he said that not, uh, was not me. Only in Silicon Valley. Just making a joke. <laughs> but we have, you know, the fact is we have dropped nuclear weapons on our own soil more than once. I could go on and on and on. So what happens? Uh, what we've become really interested in is how we bust up the nuclear priesthood. I'd like to think, um, I don't know, Christina, if this is true, but I'd like to think that Doug might recognize some of his ideas uh, in what we're trying to do. Because yes, some of the people we work with in building a network of innovators to, to work on this problem, uh, some of them are working on technological solutions. But a lot of them are thinking about how do we act like designers? How do we act actually like scientists working iteratively testing our hypotheses, uh, bringing cognitive diversity to the problem, recognizing that if we all think the same, we're going to miss the opportunities to do something very different than we've ever done before. Uh, so we're creating teams uh, that are international, teams that are cross-sectoral, and we're not really accepting anymore that nuclear weapons are the purview of only a few. We're saying, no, actually, there's a way, if you're a data scientist, there's an opportunity for you to engage on this issue. If you're a media producer, there's an opportunity for you to make a difference. I don't know if folks here watch Madam Secretary. Does anybody in the room watch Madam Secretary? Let's see some hands up. Season finale last year and then the season opener this year both dealt with nuclear weapons themes. Why was that? Because we made a grant to an organization that works with writers' rooms that works with producers and caught the attention of the showrunners of Madam Secretary, who said, you know, we actually can use our platform to better educate the public about this issue so people don't think of nuclear weapons as just uh, uh, the button that you hit to win a game, for instance, in a, in a video game, uh, but really understand the, the potential consequences of the use of nuclear weapons. So what we're looking at is a bias toward openness um, a, uh, an invitation for many people to engage organically from wherever they are, whatever expertise they bring. For all of you in technology, there are ways to make a difference on this issue. Uh, and uh, we're very heavily engaged in building the kinds of networks that I'd like to think that Doug Engelbart uh, dreamed of. As you were talking, I was struck by a couple of connections with Doug's work. Uh, first of all, evolution was a word that he used often, and I know that's central to your work. Also, the problem you're trying to solve, also in its origins, is what led to Doug's inspiration, because of course, Vannevar Bush's 1945 article, as we may think, was the public shorthand version of his report to the president, Science Endless Frontiers, which was written at that moment in time 
where the scientists and the team, the small team that worked on the Manhattan Project, looked at it as enormous success and they wanted to take their collaborative lessons and spread them out to the rest of the world, which to me raises fa a fascinating question that runs through all of what you're talking about is, what's the, the difference between small groups and large groups and what is the role of each and how does a successful small group spread something to a large group without it getting all screwed up? I don't know, Ben, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it, you know, one of the things we think about a lot is uh, when I talk about the tragic dearth of the leveraging of collective intelligence and public policy, um, I think it is distinct actually from what is possible in private capacity, either in NGOs uh, or uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in companies. And so I think it is the case that we have already demonstrated for many of the, I mean, for climate change, for example, as well, um, that we have the capacity of small groups of experts in distributed ways with distinct sets of knowledge that come together that can actually have real substantial impact on these issues, and I think that's totally necessary. Um, and it is a case that for most of these issues, without having an adoption by either the mass public or the, gov the government, or the government because of the mass public, you can't actually have, I think, a fundamental solution to, to most of them. So they're both necessary. Um, I will just say my, one of my, the challenges um, that I see, especially, frankly, in, in a place like Silicon Valley, um, is we see government as so dysfunctional, understandably, um, in, inefficient and sort of incompetent and um, something to just sort of be looked at, at from a distance. And then we want to look at sort of the capacity that we have independent of government to iterate and sort of innovate and create new possibilities, all of which are beautiful. I think we can't ignore that we also have to play that game. Um, that we also have to look at collective intelligence at a larger scale and not just create solutions, because if those are not supported by the mass public, we can have the most brilliant interventions for most public policy challenges, and it won't matter. I mean, it might matter somewhat, but for many issues, it won't matter nearly as much as it needs to. And I'm interested to hear from Erica on how the Manhattan Project may have played a role in the basic public distrust of, of science. And also based on what Ben was saying, I mean, how, how do we make sure that our, our collective IQ and our intelligence is, has the right information? So is there a departure from expertise? So I'll comment on or respond to your question. Um, and I know there's a, maybe a question behind your question because we <laughs> talked earlier about this. Um, so in terms of the public's distrust of science, I think the fact is that people in the scientific community um, <laughs> exited the Manhattan Project with plenty of distrust of their own. Um, you know, there, we all know the stories about scientists who walked away thinking, you know, what have we wrought here? Uh, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, which is still um, uh, alive today, really began as an expression of the consciences, consciences of those scientists at the Manhattan Project who needed an outlet uh, for their doubt and for their concern. Uh, but really, I would say the uh, maybe more productive uh, response is, um, was evidence in the form of what, uh, what uh, Robert Oppenheimer's brother Frank did uh, with the creation of the San Francisco Exploratorium. Um, he wrote a monograph. Uh, Christina Woolsey is here. She could tell this story better than I. Uh, wrote a monograph uh, about uh, moving toward an exploratorium, which would be a place that children and adults and people of all shapes and sizes could come and experience science in a hands-on setting, partly to um, disabuse the public of the, the sort of fear and concern about science as something separate from their ordinary lives that they had no agency over. But that question of public distrust of science, that moment in time was almost the reverse of today. The scientists had deep disquiet. Einstein famously observed, if only I'd known I would have become a watchmaker. Um, and Lord knows Robert Oppenheimer was uh, 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 the Promethean figure. But the public loved nuclear power, and it was decades before it flipped. What was the change? Well, uh, the public may have loved nuclear power, and, some, and the public still loves nuclear power. I'm not sure that the world loved nuclear weapons after Hiroshima yes, and Nagasaki. Yes, that's a good point. 
Um, but at that point, I think the sense was that the genie was out of the bottle, and there's really very little that the average person can do to make any difference whatsoever to reverse the tide of human events. Um, so I really think it's important that we um, distinguish between what happened, the innovations that came out of the Manhattan Project in terms of the use of energy, and the weaponization of that energy, which has, I think, quite a different history. Mm -hmm. Erica W. Um, I'm gonna, I, I think I've got this. It's going to be Erica G <laughs> and cool. Erica W. Uh, uh, Maylin Fung sent up a question, and I apologize to Maylin wherever she is. I'm not going to ask your question because you put a word in your question that's so important. Empathy. Mm. Ben, your work and your work is all about empathy. In particular, how do you create empathy for something where people can't go into it like you. Mm -hmm. You've seen the ocean. What role does empathy play in these challenges today? So what's interesting is I've been at the Stanford D School for about three or four months. Um, and that culture is new to me. And I've, I've been uh, recently introduced to human-centered design thinking. And I was very interested to learn about the role of a designer in um, generating and using empathy as a tool. And maybe previously I would think that when it comes to managing ocean ecosystems and protecting natural resources, it was all about understanding that ecology and the biology and the, the physics and the oceanography. Um, but I, I am now a big believer that it's all about managing people. And the idea of need finding and designing for systems and designing something for one user in mind rather than a hundred or a million. And that is what I see as making it really possible to scale and grow when you're empathizing with individuals. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about how I can inspire people to change behaviors related to ocean issues, whether it's marine pollution, overfishing, or climate change. And there, you know, no one wants to be um, bombarded with facts. No one wants to be shamed, right? And so the practice I found the most effective and also the most enjoyable is just listening and empathizing and discussing. And I really hope that, you know, full heart, clear eyes, can't lose <laughs> is a, uh, a, an approach that, that will work and will scale because it's all about connecting people to each other and to natural environments. Yeah, this is a foundational part of our work as well. Which I, mean, is, I think of change.org as an empathy engine. I mean, absolutely. I mean, we, storytelling is a, the core of what we do. Uh, and, you know, just as you said, Erica, you know, people don't you know, access issues through abstract data and policy in many cases. Uh, we don't, we're not all that effective at sort of getting people to take civic action through moralizing and trying to tell them that they're wrong by not doing so or criticizing them. It's by how do you access. The, the remarkable thing about humans, most of us, is that we have this incredible capacity for generating empathy for others when we're exposed to remarkable personal stories that resonate. When we do so, we take action not because we think we're obliged to, but out of sincere desire, and it's an, an opportunity for us to express our values and build connection. And so when we see this all the time around healthcare or human trafficking or immigration or gay rights or whatnot, it's rarely, I mean, few people wake up every day and, and think, oh, I, what I really want to do today is like fight for, you know, against human trafficking or against acid attacks in India or all these other topics. Um, but when across your feed on Facebook or in a news article or an email, you see a remarkable personal story, you resonate with that person, despite knowing them not whatsoever, like we see incredible outpouring of support and mobilization because of that. And so I think it's incumbent upon the people in professions like ours that are trying to mobilize the public, rather than berating people for not taking action, taking it upon ourselves to be responsible for crafting the kind of experiences that will engage and mobilize the public at scale. Um, and that's a lot of things we think about. It relates to a, a point I talked to my team about, um, which is you know, the, the, the user experience of civic participation kind of sucks. Mm -hmm. Like, 
the experience of voting is just not that compelling. The experience of, like, if the Jury epitome of, yeah, if, if, if civic duty is going to a city council meeting, like, there is nothing more insufferable than sitting in a four-hour city council meeting. It is remarkable, and believe School me. School board meetings, I oh think, my actually God. more insufferable, yeah. <laughs> and so, but, you know. But now, hold on a second here. So I think of Are you the, on a school board? No, and I, you wouldn't catch me dead at one. Um, but the New England Town Hall is often held up as the exemplar of, you know, Norman Rockwell, and those things still work. You talk to people in parts of New England, they still work. How do we recreate that online? I think the question is how do we create a system, instead of how do we replicate the thing that exists offline right now online, how do we get what we want out of it, which is an effective representation of citizens being able to engage and hear other people's diverse perspectives, express their own, and feel like their voice is heard, even if it's disagreed with and ultimately overturned. And so for us, we think of, okay, well, you know, I, I, I talk a lot, sorry, I'm just laughing because my team and I had this conversation today, and I said, you know, if, um, if you had a product that nobody was buying, you can either condemn your non-buyers or create a better product. And literally, like, not a lot of people are buying civic engagement in an ongoing, sustained way, and we can just condemn people for not buying that product or just make a better product. So what we're trying to do is to create a means by which citizens can come together, look at issues that they care about, see the perspectives and opinions of other people they trust and respect or deliberations and debate between them, and then make a choice. And when they take action, express their voice, be able to follow on and see the ultimate consequences of that. I mean, really the experience I want is people take action on their phone, anytime, anywhere, with people they align with and receive a video response from their mayor or member of Congress within a week on their phone. And that's totally an experience we should be able to deliver. Mm. And if you can do that, they should have dramatically better participation experience. If you look at like right now, why is it the case that you have like more photos are taken today than the total number of photos ever taken in all of human history until, I don't know, what, 2005? It's not like people became much more interested in photos. Just far easier to do and more compelling. And we want to make civic participation far easier to access and more compelling. And if you get that, you do unlock the opportunity because humans want to express voice and hear, um, you know, feel, feel like they are having their voice reflected in public form. Well, it's that. I also think it's a plot by the cats. <laughs> the, um, so can I just respond to this Please, real Eric, quickly? I so, want, and you're, yeah. I want to point out the fact that in, in one of your prior lives, you were a very skilled scenario designer. So mm -hmm. I'd love a scenario thinker's take on these issues. Oh, well, that's not what I was going to say, but I will Go come ahead. back well, to that. Yeah, you come back so to it. So let me just respond to this real quick, which is I think when you asked the question about empathy and you also yeah. earlier asked a question about scale, essentially, when you said how do we take small teams and potentially uh, create a benevolent virus so larger teams are, are positively infected with that, I think this, these two things are very much con connected. The idea that you can speak to one person, uh, that you can create a connection with one person, or that you can create the conditions in which people who should not be able to get along do get along because they have something shared that they can agree on that they're working toward. So I, in our experience, we have people who are sitting in the belly of the beast at the national labs. Uh, who go to work every day and they think their job is to keep the world safe. And then we have NGOs who think their job is to make sure that those labs don't get funded because they're the bad guys. Mm -hmm. And so what we've begun to get good at, I won't say we're perfect at it, is creating the conditions where in small groups in Washington, D.C., or in Albuquerque, New Mexico, or in London, we can over and over create moments of empathy and shared uh, goal setting. Uh, we don't have to agree on everything. We don't have to agree, for instance, as the mo most recent Nobel Peace Prize winner uh, says, she would like to make sure we get to zero nuclear weapons. We work with her, but we also work with people who say, you know what, we may, be able, may not be able to get there. Mm -hmm. But we can all agree that we don't want to have some kind of accidental catastrophe mm -hmm. on our watch. So, beginning with that, in teams, getting larger and larger, we can create scale around that mm -hmm. shared agreement. A, a, maybe a final thought on empathy is that I believe um, one of Doug Engelbart's big questions was how, how do you change people's way of thinking to change their behaviors? And I think about this a lot too, and I'm sure we all have a, a lot to, to consider, but I'm sure that one of the vital ingredients is empathy and human connection. And in your work, what's the, thinking, for example, in the climate debate, 
What's that common ground? If you were going to advise someone to find the common ground for all sides in the climate debate in the spirit of what Erica just observed, what, how would you frame that? Well, what's really interesting is um, I have had very interesting discussions with um, people that are climate deniers. I've also uh, interacted with people that believe um, GMOs cause autism. Um, I also taught in a middle school in North Carolina where I was asked not to say the word evolution. And what I... What was the alternative word you used? So I still taught evolution because it's part of the curriculum, but I said um, adaptation and change over time. And <laughs> nobody, um, <laughs> nobody caused a fuss. <laughs> and it just shows how important language is and um, measured reactions and I'm very interested to know where these ideas come from. And I recognize that my perspective is very different than their perspective in life. And I kind of turn it into a, um, a learning opportunity for myself <laughs> in, in kind of a selfish way. And I found that I've had very productive discussions with climate deniers and uh, people that believe GMOs cause autism um, because they see I'm trying to understand where they're coming from, and they afford me the same courtesy. You know, you asked about a scenario, and uh, just based on uh, some of the things that both of you had said, I would offer one up. So it's the year 2040, and in the year 2040, um, all I have a 14-year-old son, so but let's say he's 14 in the year 2040, he's going to a school where a lot of what happens over the course of the day is he's learning techniques uh, for working with other people and for empathizing. Mm -hmm. But he's also using tools, technological tools every day that he trusts because they are ways to build greater empathy and understanding. And he can see that feedback. He can see his uh, voice showing up uh, by giving a, a proxy, uh, and you mentioned liquid democracy, giving somebody else who's got greater understanding, for instance, of climate and oceans. Maybe my son is saying, well, as a 14-year-old, I look forward to giving my proxy vote to Erica Woolsey when it comes mm -hmm. to the oceans, mm -hmm. because I will never know as much as she knows about it, but I trust her, and the technology allows me to get close to her. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can begin to see a world in which we're educating young people in ways that don't separate technology from the human factors that will make them better at problem solving. Uh, so it's an inadequate scenario, but I think we have all the tools we need to begin that scenario today. I also think just one note on the, on the climate issue, which is, I think, a, an especially vexing one from a public policy perspective because there's not a natural sort of sympathetic character that you can sort of wheel out and you know, sort of mobilize people around. I do think that kids have a unique opportunity here. Um, we see on a regular basis uh, young teenagers, and in fact, in particular, a, a number of teenage girls um, who have started campaigns on the site that have been immensely powerful mobilizing people. Uh, and it's really hard to argue with teenage girls on TV. Um, it, it turns out uh, you put like, sort, anywhere, of a, like, yeah. sort of a Republican congressperson and sort of a teenager on TV, and it's, it doesn't end well um, for the member of Congress. And um, the, I'll give you one illustration of a campaign. Uh, it's like you lose before you begin. Um, it's just an 11-year-old girl who uh, there is a, and she lives just north of Chicago, and there's a. Uh, uh, she starts a campaign on the site to try to get a tax on plastic bags for like a, a school project. Uh, and then in, resp in response, the chemical lobby in the state of Illinois gets a special interest basic law passed to make it illegal for cities in Illinois to pass a tax on plastic bags. So it has to be state-based. Uh, and so she uh, is 11, doesn't know any better, and is undeterred, and she starts a petition to her governor uh, to overturn, to veto the bill. Uh, and this is just like, not, no one cares about this. It's like not in the news at all. Um, until like Abby Goldberg, she has this incredible personal story. She's like, you know, she, you know very knowledgeable of the topic, incredibly newsworthy and sort of media savvy. Uh, and we work with her and sort of she ends up doing this big delivery and gets hundreds of thousands of people to join. And it ends up being the case that the governor of her state calls her on a Saturday on her home phone and says, Abby, I've seen your campaign. I'm gonna veto the bill and you're the first to know. If he does a bill, mm. then all these kids across the country start campaigns around plastic bags and plastic straws and all these different plastic. <laughs> and like, they're just very sympathetic characters, little kids, it turns out. Um, and I just think there's a way where, 
you know, sort of kids can kind of call bullshit on adults for the future. Uh, and it's like you're screwing it for the rest of us, and it's hard to argue with little kids, as I mentioned. Um, and so I just do think there's, there's an opportunity. For most issues, healthcare, immigration, LGBT rights, all these things, there are like sympathetic characters that can speak on their own behalf. The sort of, you know, people that have been mm. put in structural sort of systematic in, injustice. Uh, but for the environment, it's really hard. Uh, same for animal rights, to be honest. Um, and kids are a really powerful vehicle for accessing mm. those issues. Mm. So, this is a moment in time where it seems like, in the last, especially in the last couple of months, pessimism has become the new and oh so fashionable black. And that seems a singularly dangerous thing to me, that nothing causes trouble worse than a sense of despair and you can't make a difference. And you all are right in the middle of making a difference and you've built communities that aren't uh, falling into that trap. How do we amplify that? How do, how do we create a paradigm where optimism outweighs pessimism? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we... I would say, I mean, <laughs> Suddenly we're not so talkative. No. Yes. Well, we, we try to do every day. So I would say, you know, one of the perversities is the you know, perverse incentives of media companies, not because they're bad people, um, but because they are companies trying to maximize revenue and we are humans that have fear-based reflexive systems that click on things that are most outrageous and sensationalized. Uh, and we largely have ad-based systems and not subscription-based, uh, is that we have a saturated media environment uh, of this sort of, yeah, pessimism. And I think it is one of the most corrosive things to an effective democracy. Because if you have people that do not have hope and do not participate, then you guarantee the very thing they fear, right. um, which is unrepresentative government. Uh, and then you get even more frustration and then even more radical reactions and elections and worse than we might have today. Uh, and so what I just said we're trying to do, and I hope many other people are trying to do as well, is how do you craft remarkable stories of everyday people making change that are actually interesting and newsworthy. One of the challenges in the social change sector is how do you make climate change and nuclear sort of, you know, non-proliferation sexy and exciting, sufficient to have the media cover it and that people want to consume it. Uh, and so on a daily basis, we think about, like, almost think about these as shows. If you were to produce an epic HBO show around immigration, healthcare, human trafficking, whatever it is, or just people making change in a local environment, like how do you make something incredible and not just feel good, but really inspirational and exciting such that they not just consume it, but share it as well. So part of us is trying, how do you identify remarkable stories of everyday people and spread it through the media and tell those stories? And I'll just be honest, we're not as good as nearly as I would like us to be, and we are trying to hire to address that. I also think we have to look at who the juggernauts in our culture are. And um, I think, frankly, we, you know, there are probably people in this room. We have a lot of responsibility for, for creating a sense of optimism. I think um, you know, we, we glorify technology companies. We glorify uh, media celebrities and so forth. Now, you're starting to sound a little pessimistic here. No, right? I'm not. I don't Bring mean I'm not pessimistic. Because actually, what I'm trying to say is I think you give people something very positive to do, and you make it easy for them to do it, and it, that becomes a positive feedback loop. And I think the truth is the more uh, celebrities and the more uh, company, large companies who step into some of these issues that they've stayed away from because maybe they're too politically uh, complex, um, and begin to make positive strides and tell positive stories about them and make it okay to engage with some of these issues. Nuclear weapons is one that people have tended to stay away from. Um, I think that these are, you know, people are look for positive stories when they see them happening in their own backyard or in their own offices. Uh, that is uh, influential. So Erica W., you're, you're in a field where you have the benefit that um, you, you have the potential to use charismatic animals. Um, doesn't work so well with nuclear. <laughs> and, and you also have, of course, famously, uh, someone who's very good at this decades ago is Jacques Cousteau. Um, what are the lessons the rest of us can learn from the field you're in and the work you're doing? Well, in terms of charismatic megafauna, um, first of all, I study corals, so you don't have faces. Okay, um, we think so. cor corals are charismatic. <laughs> good, yeah. I'm glad. Um, but what's, there's been a shift in recent decades in, in science, especially marine science, um, where it goes from single species research into ecosystem research and single species um, protection into ecosystem protection. So 
Um, you know, how like protecting the panda also protects crucial habitat, protecting turtles and dolphins also protects coral reefs. And I think that that holistic approach is very important and a, a, a great direction to go in. And um, to comment on the optimism and despair, I wonder if despair is a byproduct of optimism mm -hmm. because we're all trying to imagine this world that we want, but it's not what we're seeing every day. And lower expectations. <laughs> actually, um, a phrase I really try to live by, I think I'm paraphrasing um, Voltaire, is that don't let perfect be the enemy of good, right? Just because you can't do everything and solve all the problems every day doesn't mean you shouldn't do, ev do everything you can. And to me, that really helps compartmentalize, because sometimes it does feel like we're living in a dystopian hellscape. <laughs> but I also look towards the, um, the success stories, and there's so much good going on in um, climate change and, and ocean protection. I mean, the investments uh, in renewables by the fossil fuel industry, the, the leaders in um, governments like in California, and this amazing um, youth movement of, of taking our planet back. And I think all of that is so exciting, and it's important to um, remember all the good things that are happening. Yeah, I think that, I mean, the paradox that it is simultaneously true that we are in the best position we've ever been historically as humanity, mm -hmm. and we're in the most dangerous situation we've ever been in humanity. Mm. It would have been great to get started 20 years ago, but the second best option is starting now. There's an old Chinese proverb, what's the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. <laughs> what's the second best time to plant a tree today? Um, I've gotten a couple of questions about education, and that runs through everything that all three of you do. What are your thoughts about education, and what are the leverage points here, and how is that tied to Doug's vision of collective intelligence? Well, I uh, think that it's um, telling that uh, Erica talks about having such a good experience at the Stanford D School. Of, you know, I assume that most people know what that is, but um, the design school at Stanford. And I'm a, you know, a big proponent of teaching both design skills, which are skills of cooperation, skills of envisioning, skills of empathy, skills of needs finding uh, very early in schools. And I think we're seeing much more of that, project-based learning and design-based learning. Um, I also, frankly, think that we should teach all kids to be scenario planners. We teach history in schools. Why don't we teach skills about thinking about the future? So let me put a sharper point on this. Uh, Christina earlier showed the famous Doug Engelbart slide of technology growing exponentially and organizational wisdom growing not so fast. Um, and I think it was Will and Ariel Durant who once said that civilization is a race between education and catastrophe. Is education the place we need to pick up to close that gap? Or is it somewhere else? I think it's redesigning how we learn and how we measure knowledge and understanding and making, um, making it focused more on problem solving and flexible thinking than on memorization. And you know, being able to develop your own tools to apply to any situation. And I'm, yeah, I'm very interested in um, information literacy and science literacy so that people can be more immune to misinformation because in this age of information, it's not about finding the right answer. It's also about discarding waves upon waves of bad info. And I think um, looking at informal and formal learning systems to really hold those principles um, highly because it's, yeah, it's, it's about how we think, not what we think. I mean, the, you know, maybe the one slightly controversial approach I take on this is not that education doesn't matter. Um, it's that if you're trying to have systemic change in an issue and a set or in something quite grand, 
trying to believe that we are going to sort of, you know, change everyone by educating everyone differently in a much more material way, and that's going to somehow create some systemic shift. Um, you know, humans genetically, dispositionally are quite similar to what we were 10,000 years ago. Um, and I think institutional shift is something that's so fundamentally important. So I think of like, well, how, why do we have this, you know, failed, I think, largely democracy that we have. Um, it is not simply because the, the end of, if we just educated people more, that would be sufficient. I think we need a design institutions such that we can translate more effectively people's general default preferences into effective long-term policy outcomes in service of the interests of the public. Um, I think of just one specific example, actually, um, just as an illustration of the idiocy of our institutional design uh, and how big a consequence this might have. Um, voting. Uh, so we can either, you know, educate lots of people to try to be better at voting. Um, uh, there's, uh, or just like more informed and want to go vote. I um, mean, there's really important things there. The thing that we're trying to do is an institutional structure design where like you're voting based upon people that you trust. Um, but something specific around ranked choice voting versus just first past the post voting. So we, you know, we vote first past the post. So you have, for example, in the Republican primary in 2016, you have you know, 18 candidates, and so you have people distribute the votes across all these different candidates. And it ends up being the case that the person who is most disliked by the majority of Republican primary voters is the one who wins um, because we don't have ranked choice voting. Um, that is just insane. That's, literally, that's just an incompetent system. It's not, whether you support Trump or not, it is literally just a mistake. Like, it is not an accurate representation of people's actual preferences. If you had ranked choice voting, we would literally probably have, I mean, this is like a trillion dollar consequence from a single design flaw in an institution that is a small example of larger design flaws as well. And so I think that, I think we need to think of high leverage points of intervention that don't require us to boil the ocean that can actually get us much more to where we want to get to. Don't talk about boiling the ocean in front of her. Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> Bad analogy. So I have a last, we're, we're right down at the end, and we actually have a little bit less time than I hoped for for an answer to this question, so you all have to think very fast. Imagine that Doug Engelbart strolled in here and said, well done, chose the panel well. These are exactly the kind of folks who are capable of exponential change and improvement, and you've taken all the lessons to heart. He said, I'm going to give you what DARPA gave me 52 years ago. I'm going to give you a two-year lead time and a large budget to do a demo. What is the demo? You so you have the budget, and you've got 24 months to get ready. What demo would you do today or two years from now? Uh, well, I'm actually happy to answer this because I feel like we just did uh, something similar to this. Um, and in a way, what you've described is our team has been, has been living this scenario. We were given a certain amount of money by major philanthropy several years ago and asked to show some proof of concept that collaborative teams working together across sectors uh, with experts in the room could produce better results, essentially, than experts would on their own. Um, and just uh, two weeks ago at the Rhode Island School of Design, uh, we had the first demo um, of the results of the first cohort of the network that we've built. Uh, one of the uh, uh, demos was of a new uh, data fusion platform, open source data that aggregates uh, everything from satellite imaging to social media data to uh, export control data and allows journalists and academics to make sense of what's going on around the world in nuclear uh, nations. So it's essentially an intelligence Good. So system. she's already done her demo. Yeah, done my demo. <laughs> no pressure. Two years of vacation. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I would be really excited about diving into something similar to what I mentioned, but the idea of how do you... Firstly, what happens when you have a dynamic network of people who can go indicate by proxy the sort of people, experts, individuals they respect, or they get surfaced in the system um, that they trust most to express voice on specific issues, and then use that graph to be able to then crowdsource from anybody ideas for different legislation and sort of modifications similar to Wikipedia based upon trust, which Wikipedia also uses, and see what the ultimate policy outcomes would be, both in preferences and in innovation for addressing big problems in that kind of effective liquid democracy voting system, um, and then see how you could scale that. I mean, the biggest problem with that system, I think, is how do you get distribution, which is why literally our first focus is how do you get 50 million Americans, um, and then how do you apply that system to it? Mm -hmm. So not to put pressure on you, 
but I know, you know, you had a family connection with Doug Engelbart and you also have a connection to, family connection to Charles and Ray Ames, who did a demo once upon a time, Powers of Ten, that is in the same Olympian space as Engelbart's demo. So you've been preparing for a well. long time. For this. <laughs> First of all, I think based on what Christina said, I, I don't think he would come in and say, well done. I think he would. <laughs> You're right. They were scratching the surface. Hmm. Um, so with that analogy, I'd like to You're not off the break the surface and dive in, right? <laughs> because I actually do have an idea, and it is an idea I've, I'm looking to fund. And that is that addressing the idea that the, our ocean is so overexploited, so underprotected, and entirely out of mind to most people on Earth, even though human society relies on ocean health. And so my idea um, that I've come up with in recent years is to take people in landlocked states where they don't have any access to the ocean on virtual dives. Mm. And these are states that also have great influence on affecting climate policy, and yet they don't have that connection. And so it's one of those out of sight, out of mind issues. So I would, I would like to take, I would like to unlock the ocean for those in landlocked states to share the beauty and wonder and importance of these ecosystems that their behaviors, hundreds of miles from the ocean, is affecting. Bravo. <laughs> Anyone want to write me a check? <laughs> And with that, we will end the panel. Please thank our panelists. That was marvelous. Thanks. Very nice. It was great, Paul. Thank you. Really enjoyed that. Yeah. And now I'm I'd like to invite Karen Myers, the director of the AI lab at SRI, up to give us a closing benediction. The floor is yours. I'm not sure I have that in me. I um, wasn't trained to give benedictions, but I do have some closing remarks that I'd like to share after that excellent discussion by the panel this evening. So first of all, let me say that SRI is very honored to be here tonight celebrating the accomplishments by Doug and his team on the work they did 50 years ago at our institute um, uh, just down the road up, up in Menlo Park. Um, I'm also personally very excited to be here because my own research uh, focuses on the area of AI technologies to enable improved man-machine collaboration. So um, it's exciting for me to be a part of this event because of the, the nature of the work that I do. Um, I don't have a nice picture that I can put up on the display of me with Doug Engelbart. I've, I never had the opportunity to meet him, but I do have a personal connection that I can share, which is... For 10 years, I was in the office that apparently Doug was in at SRI, so that's kind of my connection to him. So, um, and, and I also want to say that I think Doug would be very proud of some of the work that we're continuing to do at SRI in the general area, building computers that can augment human capabilities and able to, um, to, to enable them to solve harder problems and, and do that more effectively. So I'll just throw out a few couple of quick examples. Uh, one thing that we're doing is building um, uh, next generation dialogue systems. So some of you are probably familiar with Siri. Siri came out of um, our lab at SRI. Um, what we're trying to do with, that's kind of a next generation of Siri is look at building systems where you can have ongoing dialogues with the technology. The technology knows you, it knows about you, it knows the interactions that it's had with you. And as a result of that can help you be much more effective in doing complicated kinds of tasks. In contrast, something like Siri, what you can do is ask it to you know, send an email or, or put something on your calendar, which is great, but we're trying to think about the next great thing and how we can build the technology to support much more effective interactions with, with your systems. Um, and a second example that I'll throw out is that we're working with some uh, state-of-the-art deep learning technology, um, a type of technology called GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. And we're using that in the space of helping human designers um, think out of the box, think about new ways you can create artifacts that maybe they wouldn't have thought of before because they're sort of bound by their education and their training and what they've been exposed to. These kinds of technologies can kind of hallucinate things, come up with ideas or suggestions that maybe a human wouldn't have thought about because they have their own cultural biases towards doing different kinds of design tasks. 
that's just a little bit of an overview of some of the things that we're doing that uh, we like to think would, would, would be very much in the spirit of uh, technologies that Doug would think are uh, helping augment human capabilities in, in interesting ways. Um, I was going to introduce the concept of wicked problems, but Erica Gregory beat me to it um, and say that the kinds of problems that the panel is talking about today really reminded me of, of that concept. So in case some of you are maybe not familiar with that, um, it's a term that uh, coincidentally actually uh, was coined right about 1968. It was by a German researcher. Um, he was a design researcher um, by the name of Horst Riddle. And uh, he coined this problem to, to, to define a class of problems that are so hard, they're so complex, and so many interesting factors that are uh, in, in interrelated and, and very hard to understand ways that they may not even be soluble. Um, so there's a whole body of work that's grown up around this concept of wicked problems and trying to understand how you disentangle them and, 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 and solve them. And I think you know, tonight we heard some examples of some really uh, uh, important problems in our society in this space, and, and also encouragingly some, some great approaches to how to address those kinds of problems. Um, the three problems that we're focused on tonight are, in, in some sense, um, problems that were derived from, uh, from our society as a whole. But we in the tech community, uh, unfortunately, I think, are creating some of our own wicked problems that, that we need to think about solving. And one that's getting a lot of, uh, appropriately so, a lot of attention in the media has to do with job displacement, right? So we're building great automation capabilities. Um, but as a result of that, we've had uh, you know, major loss of jobs in the manufacturing sector and you know, are probably about to see a lot of losses in the transportation sector as well. So you know, we as a community also have to be thinking about what are the consequences of introducing this technology and how can we mitigate the effects on those people who are, are most impacted by the introduction of that technology. So um, I wanted to move on then and talk a little bit about this, this question of um, you know, optimism versus pessimism. And um, before he, having heard the panel, I'd already thought that I was going to come down on the optimistic side. But, but actually hearing some of the great things that our panelists are involved with has made me even more optimistic. But I did want to share one little personal anecdote of what makes me very optimistic about the future and uh, being able to solve some of these hard problems. So um, I've got a teenage son. He likes to spend lots of time outdoors. Um, and uh, one day this summer, after he'd come home with uh, yet another sunburn, I gave him a lecture about, you know, you've got to use sunscreen if you're not doing it. By the time you get to my age, you're going to have skin cancer. So you know, you really have to do this. And, he just looked at me the way teenagers do and shook his head knowingly and he said, Mom, don't worry about it. My generation is going to cure cancer. And <laughs> of course I said, I don't care. I still want you using sunscreen. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but um, that, that's really stuck with me because to me it's so representative of the optimism and the enthusiasm of uh, the younger generation. Um, it's important that they be um, engaged and excited about solving these problems because they're the real stakeholders that are going to be most impacted by some of the problems we heard about today. They're the ones who are going to have to live with the consequences of, of, of not coming up with good solutions to these problems. But I guess I'm very optimistic because, um, not that my son will cure cancer, but that uh, maybe uh, his generation, people in his cohort will, will be able to do that. And, Part of that, I think, stems from the fact that they are motivated, they want to change. A lot of it, too, these kids are digital natives, right? They grew up with technology almost from the day that they were born. They love technology, they're facile with it, um, and they believe in change. They believe that they can make a difference in the world and that technology is the way to make that happen. So, um, I, like I said, I'm optimistic about the future and I'm very excited to think about you know, this, this current generation of youth and all the great things that they are going to do, leveraging the products of some of Doug Engelbert's earlier research, the technology that he was able to generate, um, and with that technology being to, able to achieve Doug's larger goal, which was to actually um, have significant social impact change uh, for the greater good of our society. So thank you very much.